You're listening to Catholic Chicago. Ahead, the Archdiocese of Chicago brings you programs about the people, events, and issues that touch our lives. Welcome to Catholic Chicago. Good afternoon, good morning, whenever you're listening to this or viewing it on YouTube. My name is Joyce Deriga and welcome to Beyond the Headlines. Um, this is where we take a look at um, behind the headlines in the Chicago Catholic about the, with the people who are making the news um, in the, the Archdiocese of Chicago. Today we're sort of doing an advance of a story that will come out in the following issue. It's about the National Catholic National Eucharistic Revival that's um, starting on Corpus Christi Sunday. And today we have Sister Alicia Torres. She's a Franciscan of the Eucharist of Chicago. She's on the executive it's executive team, right? That's how you call it? That's what you call it? Yeah. For the National Eucharist... Yeah, oh my gosh. I am like stumbling with my words. The National Eucharistic Revival. So welcome, mm -hmm. Sister. Good to see you today. Thanks so much. It is a bit of a tongue twister for sure. <laughs> So can you explain to everybody what the revival is, and then we're going to throw it to a, a video of you kind of giving sure, some spiritual sure. thoughts. Go ahead. Yeah, so the bishops in the United States have really discerned, um, I think, an incredibly exciting and spot-on response to the crisis of faith that we see at this time. And what I mean by that is there was a Pew Research study back in 2019 that indicated a vast majority, or rather a vast minority, of Catholics do not believe that the Eucharist is truly Jesus Christ, the church's doctrine of the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. Um, so the majority of our Catholics, even a large number of churchgoers, don't believe that. Um, and it's not a moment to criticize why is that so, but rather an opportunity to respond. And so when Bishop Barron was the chairman of the committee for evangelization and catechesis he was really um really making the bishops aware of this crisis highlighting that he did some really neat work that offered some solutions and his outgoing recommendation was a eucharistic revival in came bishop cousins who's now the ordinary for crookston um, a wonderful bishop here in the united states and then also in came the pandemic yeah. And so the bishops have been hoping to inaugurate and to animate the survival for a while. And so finally, we're literally on the cusp. And it is, the desire is not to have an event, not to have a program, but rather to inspire a movement um, from the grassroots supported by the church, the institutional church, um, and all of her members, that, that we would have a, a, a literally a living movement of Catholics that have been healed, transformed, converted, and sent out to bring this message that Jesus is alive among us for our life, for the life of the world. Um, so it starts out this June 19th with Corpus Christi Sunday, and the first year is focused on the diocesan level, then coming down the second year to the parish level and moving toward a uh, National Eucharistic Congress in Indianapolis in the summer of 2024. It's a really neat whole process, so we're, we're going to dig into it a little bit more, um, but first, we're going to play a video. Um, for those of you who are listening on the radio, um, you can also see this video at the it's EucharisticRevival.org. It's a video of Sister Alicia talking about Jesus and the whole kind of mission of the um, and spirit of the revival. So we'll take a look and a listen. When I was in college, I went to daily mass, but I didn't really know Jesus. Then I started going to Eucharistic adoration. It was in those quiet moments before the Blessed Sacrament that I began to really know him and realize that I was known by him. The Mass became more real and my life became more real. 
I discovered a peace and joy I didn't know was possible, and in the sufferings of life, I know I'm not alone. It's been nearly two decades since I first really met Jesus in the Eucharist, and today I'm inviting you to meet him too. Perhaps you already know Jesus. He's inviting you to go deeper and to bear greater fruit. Maybe you're not so sure about Jesus, not sure he's really present in the Eucharist. Today, he's inviting you to take a risk, make a step toward him, he'll do the rest. As our country enters into these years of National Eucharistic Revival, what keeps coming to mind for me is how Jesus grew close to his first disciples. He journeyed with them through life, and when they were ready, he sent them out. In the same way, Jesus is inviting us to draw close to him so he can send us out to share the good news of how transformative a relationship with him can be. Imagine our church and our country teeming with people who are filled with the peace and joy that come from a relationship of knowing Jesus. It would be amazing. And that, my friends, is the potential impact of the National Eucharistic Revival. There are some people who like to read history. Others like to ignore it. Today, Jesus is inviting us to join him and make history, to be part of a movement of Catholics healed, transformed, and sent out on mission for the life of the world. That whole image that you paint at the end about a, a, na a nation teeming with people who are, you know, who under are on fire for Jesus through the Eucharist, right? Can you imagine? I mean, just, it kind of gives you goosebumps. So, <laughs> right? So it starts on Corpus Christi and locally we're going to, there's going to be a procession at Holy Name Cathedral at 530 on the 17th, not the 18th, 17th in Bishop Bob Lombardo, who's, um, uh, part of, well, founded at least Sister Alicia's community and is one of our auxiliary bishops is going to lead it. He's also on the Bishop's Committee for the Eucharistic Revival. So everybody's invited to that. It's right after the 5.30 p.m. Mass and Bishop Bob's celebrating the Mass, I think, right, Sister? Right. Bishop Lombard will be there. It's actually the 18th is that Saturday. 18th, sorry. 19th mm -hmm. No, no Sunday. worries. There's okay. a lot to remember. Um, so can you talk about, so that, that'll be the kickoff for the diocesan level, and we're still working on the what that's going to look like here, but can you talk about what you all envision um, or you hope that maybe diocese will, will do? Right, yeah, for sure. So every diocese has been invited to, or all the different local bishops have been invited to appoint someone to help lead animating the revival in their local church. Um, so we're really blessed. We have two wonderful men from the Archdiocese that are leading it here for us. And they're to hopefully build a team of people to help enliven it here in Chicago. So for every diocese, it's going to look different, whether it's a rural diocese, an urban diocese, more suburban. The needs of God's people are different in different places, right? And so really allowing people to exercise that principle of subsidiarity to discern what is it that's needed here. But some of the things that we hope and we dream that dioceses will embrace include having a local Eucharistic Congress, like a diocesan level Eucharistic Congress or assembly, having days of formation or days of reflection for diocesan leadership. We have a whole team of priests, including three of our own wonderful priests from the Archdiocese who have been formed to serve as national Eucharistic preachers in a sense to be the front lines of proclaiming um, the charismatic uh, Eucharistic message of the gospel. You know, it's really interesting when you think about it, even before the gospels were put to paper, the Eucharist was being celebrated. And so the Eucharist has always been at the heart of the proclamation of what Jesus has done for us. Um, and I'm just really excited to see the fruit of these Eucharistic preachers. We have Father Manny Durantes, Father Tim Anastos, and Father Connor Danstrom from the Archdiocese, as well as Father Brian Walter. He's actually one of ours as well, but currently assigned at the Institute for Priestly Formation in Omaha. So we really feel proud to have four of our own from Chicago that will be serving on this team as well. So those priests will be available to serve at diocesan level events throughout the diocesan year, whether they be youth rallies, um, special events for clergy or, or various things of that nature. So we're really excited to see how that will go. Um, in addition to that, encouraging dioceses to host things like 40 hours devotion, mm -hmm. having special nights of reflection, Eucharistic adoration, reconciliation during Advent and Lent, 
um, really hitting during this initial year of the revival, the diocesan level, the leadership, whether they be the principals, the clergy, people that work at the chancery, um, those who work in parishes, so that when we get to the parish year in 2023, we'll have all of those really important leaders locally ready to help bring it into the parish and allow it to spread even more organically among God's people. And those preachers came to Mission Our Lady of the Angels to for that formation. Yeah, can you they just give did. a brief? Yeah, in April, we were really blessed to host a retreat for the preachers. And I, I, I very much um, admire Bishop Cousins in so many ways, but he felt so strongly that it, there needed to be a retreat and we needed to bring them together in person. And so definitely despite all the odds of the looming whether or not COVID would still be with us, um, the Holy Spirit provided abundantly. And it was an incredible moment of grace. It was really humbling for me to see um, the vast majority of the preachers made it to Chicago literally the week before Holy Week, probably one of the busiest planning right. times for a priest. And they entered into it with such a prayerful spirit. So I have so much hope and confidence in how the Lord will work through them and their preaching. I think it's exciting. So what we're talking, we're, today we're talking with Sister Alicia Torres. She's a Franciscan of the Eucharist of Chicago. She's on the executive team for the National Eucharistic Revival. And when we come back, let's talk about what a revival kind of is, and then we can talk about the parish level and stuff. But um, this is Beyond the Headlines, and we'll be going to take a short break, and um, we'll be right back. Thank you. Imagine spending a week on the tranquil grounds of the University of St. Mary of the Lake where you can pray, reflect, and learn from the rich treasures of the Bible. An invitation for all to experience the annual Summer Scripture Conference, June 19th to 24th, might just be for you. Notable scripture scholars from across the United States will present this year's program, focusing on interpreting scripture in the church. The five presenters will share on a variety of topics, including interpreting scripture and the Vatican II documents, different Christian denominations and how they differ in perspectives on scripture, the Bible and politics in America today, what scripture says about children, how to use scripture in prayer, and interpreting scripture for the life and mission of the church. For registration and conference package information, visit our website at www.usml.edu slash summer scripture or call 847-837-4575. This year's conference will be both in person and virtual. This is year 44 for me teaching. When I started here, there were teachers here that had taught me when I was a student. Now I'm the old person. <laughs> right now, I teach junior high math. I love when kids find what I'm teaching to be fun and they get it. They see that light bulb go off and it's a thrill. People are always amazed. What? what? You're here for 44 years? It's hard for me to believe, frankly. <laughs> I love what I do. Every summer I think, oh, I miss the classroom. Even on the weekends, I think I can't wait to get back on Monday and teach those quadratic equations. <laughs> Shape the next generation of leaders. Teach. Apply today at artchicago.org slash school jobs. Catholic Charities is establishing a forum for dialogue and debate about complex issues in our world involving social values, faith, social justice, and the mission of charity. We are convening professionals who influence corporate, philanthropic, and government decision-making to foster greater awareness about the needs of our region and the power of faith in serving. Join us for the first gathering of the St. Martin de Porres Society on Wednesday, June 22nd at the Newberry Library, 60 West Walton Street in Chicago. St. Martin de Porres was a Peruvian lay brother of the Dominican order who is noted for his work on behalf of the poor. 
At this inaugural event, Bishop Robert Lombardo and Sally Blount, Catholic Charities President and Chief Executive Officer, will lead a discussion on poverty and the Catholic response. For more information on attending this special event, call 312-948-6797 or email us at partners at catholiccharities.net. back to Beyond the Headlines. My name is Joyce DeRiga. I'm editor of Chicago Catholic. And before we get back to the our guest today, just want to plug the newspaper. Um, we've been around for uh, over 125 years. And um, you can visit us at chicagocatholic.com. You can register for our e-newsletter that's free. Follow us on social media or sign up for a subscription. It's $30 for a year, and that goes to support our ministry. Some of the recent stuff that we've got in the newspaper, we've got coverage of the ordination of our deacons. There are 20 of them, and then our two new priests. And we also have the uh, profiles, short profiles on the priests celebrating 25 years of priesthood and 50 years of priesthood. And we have the oldest priest in the Archdiocese who just turned 100. They had a birthday party for him. So that's chicagocatholic.com. So today we're talking about the National Eucharistic Revival that starts on Corpus Christi, which is June 19th, right, Sister? Why don't I have to? Yeah, so we're talking to Sister Alicia Torres, who's on um, the national team to implement this revival. So, you know, when I think of revival, I think of our churches on the South side, like the African-American churches, because a revival is something that um, seems to be kind of rooted in, in that kind of tradition. But it's very, I've been to a couple and they're super fun. And But can you talk about a little bit of that spirit of what a revival is and how it kind of translates to this this effort? Right. And it's a perfect time to reflect on that, I think, Joyce, because we're about to liturgically celebrate Pentecost, right. right? And it's really that tremendous gift that Jesus promised to send us of his spirit to dwell in us and among us to enliven us and give us the ability to literally go out to the ends of the world with this message of salvation um, that's been entrusted to us through Jesus' passion, death, and resurrection. So that revival spirit is a gift, I think, of the Holy Spirit. And certainly nothing that like we could plan, right? Like we're certainly planning a national Eucharistic revival, but we are able to do that because we believe we're listening deeply to the Holy Spirit. The bishops have been listening. We are accompanying and assisting in that listening um, as different people around the country supporting these efforts to enliven the revival. Um, but I keep reminding my own self that like you can't just plan and make a revival happen it's the work of the lord you know and so i really do see um what's been most hopeful for me i've been on the team since last july so july 2021 when we started formally meeting um and assisting is just how excited people get when you share with them about this so mm. you know there's always been this idea in the catholic church of the sense of fide, fide the sense of the faithful and my experience of the sense of the faithful when I share about the revival is joy, excitement, hope, um, seeing an opportunity. And I think that something that's so beautiful about it is there's so much room for each diocese to really enliven it in a way that makes the best sense and that will help reach their people the most powerfully. Um, so those to me are all signs that the spirit is alive in the church and that he really wants to help bear great fruit through this effort to allow Jesus to, in a sense, reclaim his rightful place. Like yeah. Eucharist, as the council teaches us, is the source and summit of our faith. It's really not rocket science. Like this yeah. is pretty basic and should be pretty simple. You know, we did um, a, a special section. We asked people to write in or send us emails on why they go to daily mass and kind of mm -hmm. what the fruits of daily mass 
um, have been in their life. And I mean, we got the most responses we ever, ever did for something. And they're always so, you know, even when we're doing stories and stuff, you talk, you hear about, you know, well, I was, um, I got involved in Eucharistic Adoration and it, it, the changed my life and X, Y, Z, you know, and, and I think that, um, I'm excited about this because I, you know, you see this stuff and you know, it, it, um, the Eucharist is the source and summit of our Christian faith. And, you know, we've been watching, as you were alluded to the Pew study. Yeah, we've been watching that. People, you know, you have casual conversations with your friends or something, and they'll be like, oh, it's just a wafer. It's like, no, it's not just a wafer. It's Jesus. So um, can you talk about what you hope that, um, or what you all are envisioning for when it goes to the parish level after one year? Right. So we, yeah, we're really hoping that what happens on the dais and little can kind of seep down into the parish. A couple of things, particularly for the parish year, would be encouraging Eucharistic adoration at whatever is the next step for the parish, as well as this idea of having small groups around themes that have to do with the Eucharist. So opportunities for people to come together to grow in their Eucharistic faith, to learn a little bit more, but also to deepen in their devotion and really to help um, enliven that relationship. And something that's really important to note with the National Eucharistic Revival is certainly one of the pillars is to help present in a way that people can receive it, the beautiful doctrine of the church, right? We want to be able to share the truth, the beauty and the goodness of what we believe. We want to be able to help encourage and enliven the liturgy and the celebration of the mass. Um, the mass is at the heart of the life of the church. You know, so Eucharistic adoration flows from the Mass and leads us back to the Mass. And so I think it's not a secret that many of our Catholics don't really understand the Mass. I know for myself, it's taken me decades right. to grow slowly to understand the treasure of the Mass. We're literally the closest to heaven that we can be, that we're re literally reliving the Paschal mystery every celebration of the Eucharist. And so that's a treasure that we want to share and proclaim. And yet, remember, those very last words at mass the priest says our <laughs> go <laughs> we are sent from the altar of the lord into the world you know and often i'll tell the little children that i that i have the privilege to accompany um as a religion teacher when they're especially preparing for holy communion to receive Jesus for the first time. I mean, we may be the only tabernacle that someone ever encounters. Uh, you know, if Jesus is in us, if we receive him in the Eucharist, we bring him into the world. And so there's also a very important dimension of living a Eucharistic life, whether that is works of service and accompaniment with the poor, the vulnerable, the elderly, that's standing up for um, the important justice issues of our day and age that a relationship with Jesus in the Eucharist to be real can't just be this private devotion or private experience. It has to blossom us out yeah. to our families, to our friends and into the world. So like I like I have deep hope also to see just renewal and healing in family systems. And I mean, the potential fruits are innumerable because the Holy Spirit is created. Um, yeah, I just get really excited as you can see. Right, and that's how it works. Like you have an encounter with Jesus, Jesus, you fall in love with Jesus, Jesus changes your heart, right? And then you mm -hmm. want to share that with everybody else. Right. So that's totally. really what gets me all chucked up. So it's going to end with a conference, Congress, mm -hmm. right? Down in Indy? Right. So in July of 2024, there will be, I believe it's the first one since 1976, um, but we'll have to fact check that one, National Eucharistic Congress. So we haven't had one of these in the United States in a very long time. Yeah. And just to speak a little bit of a prophetic word, um, on the stage in the last National Eucharistic Congress was shared by the soon-to-be Pope John Paul II and the now St. Teresa of Calcutta. Um, so wow, really? They were imagine, both there? Wow. Yeah, they were both there. Holy cow. So I can't imagine that the Lord isn't already preparing the next generation of saints wow. to be a part of this revival. Um, and we might not be around to see who those saints are, you know, to see the church name them, but wow, I'm excited about that. And, you know, we see the National Eucharist Congress more as something that we are moving toward than an end point, because at the Congress, the vision is to actually commission up to 100,000 
National Eucharistic missionaries, people who have been so touched by their encounter with Jesus that they have this deep thirst and desire to bring him to the existential and practical margins of society, whether it be to the very poor, to the prison gates, to those who have no faith at all, to the atheist, the agnostic. So we definitely see that Congress is kind of like maybe another Pentecostal moment, right? Where like we are coming together as church from this whole country to then be sent out again, you know, and there's a deep hope that that will be the first of many subsequent National Eucharistic Congresses that we can restart this in the church in America. And there's even hope and discussion around some some semblance of a National Eucharistic procession oh, leading wow. to the Congress. So that's still in the works. We're still waiting to see how will the Lord supply for that? But there's a lot of excitement and enthusiasm around that too. Um, I mean, the sky is really the limit on all of this. And like our, I think it's a question of faith. Like how much do we have, how much faith do we have that the Lord is going to supply for something amazing for us? And then how can, you've got some ways people can get involved right now on their website. Can you share a little bit about that? Right. So, um, the website is beautiful. We just actually launched the 2.0 version yesterday. So you all are some of the first people um, seeing our new branding, um, our gorgeous um, design. We're super grateful to be partnered with Five Stones, who are a wonderful Catholic firm down state Illinois. Um, so you're getting a new glimpse at this, um, this branding that we just put together. But there are a couple of things you can sign up for. We're going to be starting a weekly newsletter that will include both already curated content as well as new content that's going to be generated throughout these years leading up to the Eucharistic Congress. There's also an opportunity to sign up and be a prayer warrior for the revival as well, which we deeply need people to pray every day for the revival. I'm very happy to share that we have cloistered um, religious communities around the entire country that have been interceding since wow. last fall for the revival. Um, and we also have a nice, beautiful network of, of people that are homebound right now that are also interceding. Um, but anyone can be an intercessor, and we deeply need that. Something to look for is, I alluded to the Eucharistic missionaries, we don't want to only um, commission people who will be kind of traditional missionaries, but we're also hoping to provide an opportunity for every single Catholic to, in a sense, reimagine their baptismal vow in being a missionary and being a gospel proclaimer. And so ways that we can all engage in the missionary dimension of the sacrament of baptism that we've received as Catholics to be able to be sent forth to share the good news of what Jesus has done and will do for us. Um, so definitely keep checking that Revival website, sign up for the newsletter, and we will continue to share and provide content as it's developed and opportunities as they come forth. Awesome. So Thank you so much. So today we've been talking to Sister Alicia uh, Torres. She's a Franciscan Sister of the Eucharist of Chicago. She's part of the National Eucharistic Revival that starts on Corpus Christi. And this is all exciting. And um, just remind everybody to go to chicagocatholic.com. We'll be following this and we'll be sharing stories about what's going on in the diocese around the Eucharistic Revival. I know that um, I've heard Cardinal Supich is super excited about it. So. Mm -hmm. So Sister Lisa, thank you so much for joining us today. And thanks everybody for tuning in on YouTube or on the radio. This has been Beyond the Headlines and I'm Joyce Deriga and have a gentle and joy-filled day. Bye-bye.